Hi, my name is Andy Lauda, and I'm the Director of Product Marketing for AppleNet, which is Apple's Internet Software Division. You know, these days, virtually everyone wants to set up their own web page, whether it's a home user who wants to set up a family website, or a small business, maybe who wants to market their products globally on the Internet. Maybe it's a school, students within a school who want to share uh, their learning experiences with other students around the world, or big businesses that want to do online commerce. On the internet, it's really critical to make your site compelling. It's the compelling sites that attract repeat visits. And therefore, in order to be successful on the internet, creating a great, creating a cool site is very important. As you probably already know, most sites on the internet are created on Macintosh computers. But what's even more important to notice is that the bulk of the really cool sites, the really compelling sites, are created on a Mac. So what we're trying to do at Apple is provide the technologies and products and tools so that virtually anybody can create, distribute, and consume great, compelling content on the internet. In order to achieve that goal, we're starting at the operating system, at the Mac OS, building internet capabilities directly into the Mac OS, making it an open system by incorporating IP networking, by making Java an integrated part of the Macintosh, and by leveraging technologies like OpenDoc to bring all of the different component architectures you find on the internet into your work on the Macintosh. We're also defining new standards, new standards for creating playing back great content like the QuickTime Media Layer, which allows you to, to display everything from 3D graphics to virtual reality scenes to time-based media across the internet. We're also defining new standards to help you locate and find information on the internet more effectively and more easily. Technologies like Hot Sauce MCF and VTwin. And finally, we're taking these technologies and putting them into products, products that you can use to make you an internet publisher. Some of the products we're going to take a quick look at today are first the Mac OS runtime for Java. In fact, Apple was the first company to integrate Java right into the Macintosh operating system, providing Java services at the desktop layer. Next, we're going to take a look at Apple Share IP, the next generation of Apple Share, which provides a workgroup productivity solution based on internet and intranet standards. We're going to look at a new product from Apple called Personal Web Sharing, which is a product that lets anybody who has a computer and a network connection set up their own website. We'll take a quick look at CyberDog, the open doc based technology that allows you to bring internet content into your work. And finally, we'll take a quick look at a new product called Coco. Coco is a multimedia authoring tool for kids that allows even kids, or kids of all ages for that matter, to create great, compelling multimedia internet content. Hi, my name is Will Iverson. I'm the Java Runtime Product Manager here at Apple Computer. I'm here to talk about a couple of different things uh, involving Java on the Mac. Uh, the first, of course, is the Mac OS Runtime for Java. We've just recently shipped the first version of the Java Runtime, Final. It's available publicly for free on our website, and it'll be bundled with Tempo, our next system software release. The Java Runtime lets you run any Java software. There's a huge variety of Java software available, both on the net and available from other application vendors. Um, for example, one of the most interesting pieces of software now available is the Corel Office for Java. As you can see, it's a complete word processor, spreadsheet, and 3D charting package, all built into one. It's, it has a familiar look and feel with Mac scroll bars, menu bars, and I can go ahead and even do things like insert spreadsheets additionally. And you can see that all that, stu all that stuff happens just by a click and a drag. So it's the familiar look and feel and user interface of the Macintosh combined with the power of Java. The neat thing about this software is, is that this software wasn't even written for the Macintosh. It was all written on a Unix box and then just brought over with a simple drag and double clicked and it launched on the Mac. Another piece of software I'm going to show you is the Marimba Castanet Tuner. Let me go ahead and hide the Corel suite. The Marimba Tuner is a package that lets you subscribe to software. So here you can see a list of software offered by trans.marimba.com. So you're familiar with www.apple.com or any other website. Instead of being, vending HTML pages, what the Marimba Tuner lets you do is subscribe to software. 
The neat thing about this is, is that you can even run this software when you're off the network. One example of a piece of software that's available through the Marimba Castanet Tuner is this program called Pencil Me In from a company called Soros. It's a complete calendaring package. So I can go ahead and look at my day or weekly detail or even a monthly de overview of what my current calendar is. I can make appointments, I can schedule, and the neat part is, is that no matter what kind of computer I'm using, I can still access this software. Like I said earlier, the Mac OS runtime for Java is available today off the website off of Apple's main website. We also have um, a version 1.5 of the Mac OS runtime for Java, which will be available later this year, in the next, by the end of the next calendar quarter. That will be version 1.5, and it will include, among other things, uh, a JIT, which is a performance technology that provides, on average, a 10 times increase in performance, as well as the Marimba Castanet tuner itself, which will be bundling with the Java runtime. Later on, we'll have MRJ 2.0, which will include JDK 1.1 functionality for those of you who've been following Java closely. Thanks for watching. Hi, my name is John Hene. I'm the product manager for AppleShare IP 5.0. I'd like to take a few minutes and walk you through some of the features of the product, and then at the end, give you a demonstration. AppleShare IP 5.0 is a suite of five services. It offers traditional file sharing, which you're familiar with under AppleShare today, but we've extended that to incorporate TCP IP, and then I've added other services including FTP or file transfer protocol, an internet web server, an internet mail server, and then a new uh, AppleTalk-based print server. One of the big enhancements in AppleShare IP 5.0 is the support for TCP IP. It's been a big request from our customers to add AppleShare support for TCP IP, and we've done that in two ways. One is to provide AFP services, or Apple Talk Filing Protocol, over TCP IP and integrate that into the experience of the Macintosh. So from the Macintosh, a person through the chooser can log into an AppleShare IP 5.0 file server using the same interface that they're accustomed to from the past, but get the benefits of the performance of TCP IP. The system requirements for AppleShare IP 5.0 are, are fairly basic. First, it's a PowerPC processor, 601, 604, 604E. We don't support any of the 68040 or 030 systems. AppleShare IP 5.0 is completely native. It requires System 7.6, which we've included in the box, and also Open Transport version 1.1.2, which is also included. Additionally, AppleShare IP 5.0 requires 32 megabytes of RAM installed in the computer. So let me take you through the product and give you a demonstration of how a Macintosh user would log into AppleShare IP 5.0. We've kept this experience the same, but given the user the benefit of TCP IP. And what I mean by that is, let's take a look at the chooser. You select the AppleShare icon, click on the name of the server. You'll notice, however, that in the chooser there's a new box called Server IP Address. If you click on this, you can type in an IP address of a server. And this might be the name of a server, either DNS or IP address, of a server that's across on the internet. Begin the login process. And you'll notice that the experience has, has stayed the same for the user. I can still drag and drop files, but now we're using TCP IP as our transport rather than Apple Talk. The benefit would be increased performance, two to three hundred percent over Apple Talk. But at the same time, we're keeping the benefit of the Macintosh interface. My name is Stacey Irvine, a product marketing manager in AppleNet. I'm here to talk to you today about personal web sharing. It's the easiest way for an individual to share information across an intranet. This is something we'll be shipping in about a week and a half. It's, it will be part of system software going forward. And first, I'd like to start with what's the problem we're trying to solve with this, uh, with this product? The customer problem we're trying to solve is how to share information within a work group. If an individual is in a work group, they often need to share information with other people in the work group, things like sales figures, draft proposals, other things. If I'm on a network of 100% Macintosh, it's pretty easy. All I have to do is take the file and t drop it in a folder and enable personal file sharing and everyone has access to it. But what if I'm on a network that has things other than Macintosh? If I have Windows NT, Windows 95, Unix, I have a lot of different types of systems that I need to share information with, personal file sharing isn't going to help me. The one thing I can count on is that everyone else on the network will have access to a web browser. Whether it's Netscape Navigator, CyberDog, Microsoft Information Explorer, 
if I can take that information and share it in a platform neutral, content neutral format, then everyone can have access to it. And that's what personal web sharing does. Who are the kinds of people we think will use, be using it? College professors being able to publish their office hours so their students have access to them. Uh, the sales professionals as this week's sales figures, they want to get it out on the internet. Uh, make it available to people on their local area network and they want to do it quickly and they don't want to have to go through MIS. They just want to have control over what gets shared and when it gets shared. Finally, the third group we think will be using it is publishing professionals, people who are prototyping a, prototyping a website. They can get it, everything working on their local machine. Once they have everything working the way that it's supposed to be working, have people in their local work group chat, check it out and test it and try it, then they can put it up on the dedicated server. So let's take a look at how this works. Configuring personal file sharing is very simple. It's a control panel. Once I do run the installer script, I just go to the control panels folder and I get this dialog screen. If I want a uh, very simple configuration, all I have to do is click start and the system starts up. And I'm using, right now I'm using personal file sharing to control access, though I could also have it set up to give everyone access. It goes out and talks with, uh, Sees, it talks to TCPIP and sees what kind of uh, what my IP address is. If I had a domain name server on the system, it would also list my domain name. So if I had, for example, Irvine.apple.com, that would show up here as well. So I could give someone my domain name instead of having to give them a string of an IP address. So it gives me a choice of a folder to go ahead and select the uh, files that I want to go ahead and share, and it comes with a default home page, uh, or I can go ahead and create my own. And that's what I've done here. I selected my default home page. So now I'm going to go into Navigator and take a look at what this looks like. So this is a web page that I created while I was out of the office at Macworld. This is just plain HTML. It does the kind of things I'd expect. I click on a link. It opens up the link. I can see uh, the different things that are coming up. So for example, I've taken the sales figures for this week and gone ahead and put them in HTML into an HTML table. And now I can see them on the screen. So this is great if I know how to write HTML, but what if I'm a college professor or an English professor or something and I write great creative writing and prose, poetry and prose, but when it comes to HTML, if I see that A, href, open bracket, you know, it's just not going to work. But I still want to take some information and share it across the internet. So I have the option under here of saying HTML, no, I don't want to do that HTML stuff. So I say I don't want to have a home page. And in this case, it says, well, we're going to use something called Personal NetFinder. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Personal NetFinder gives me a graphical view of the files that I've gone ahead and shared. And you'll notice that this looks like the Finder. I have icons on the left-hand side that indicate what kind of file it is that I'm sharing. I, I have name, I have size, I have kind. I can sort on the different types of files that are out there. It's a very finder-like interface. And it, this is available from any web browser. So if I'm in Microsoft Information Explorer, I'm in CyberDog, I'm in Netscape, whether I'm on Windows NT, Windows 95, Unix, or the Mac OS, I get the same view. Things look the same no matter, uh, no matter which browser or which client I'm coming in from. It's just generating straight HTML and displaying it on the page. So that, uh, that home page that I created earlier, I can go ahead and click on it, and it comes up, and it comes the same way it did as if it was the default home page. So I can browse HTML. But remember those sales figures. I had to write some HTML to get them into a table to display on the HTML page. What if I find the original uh, Claris Works document, the spreadsheet that had that information? There it is right there. It's a Claris Works format document, and it's going ahead and launching Claris Works for me and opening it up on the screen. So I didn't have to do any t file translation. I didn't have to write it any HTML. This is a native Claris Works document. Uh, just to op open it up in the spreadsheet. It's doing that through uh, configuring different MIME types because so it, it knows that on the client and the server that these which MIME type to open, and it goes ahead and opens it. If, for example, if this if I had Claris Works on the Windows side, it would launch Claris Works on the Windows side. If I had Excel on Mac and Excel on Windows, it would open the appropriate application on the other side. I'd like to show you something a little bit more about how well it performs, because I know most people have personal file sharing enabled if they're on a local area network. And if someone's hitting your machine, you know. You know, your machine crawl, crawls to a halt, and you know someone's downloading uh, software from your drive. Now, um, this is a ten, over 10 megabyte QuickTime movie. I'm going to go ahead and drag this out to my desktop, so I'm copying it to my local machine. 
and I'm going to watch how that copy goes in the background. And in the meantime, I'm going to bring up Claris Works, and I'm going to create a new word processing document, and make the window a little bit smaller so I can see the copy still going on in the background. And I'm going to type and see that there is no hit, on, there is no performance hit on foreground applications. So I can go ahead and continue to work while things are happening in the background, while I'm sharing data and sharing files in the background. It's a very high performance, well behaved application, uh, makes good use of system resources. Now, I'm going to go ahead and cancel that. When I go ahead and share information out of the networks, so you might see, think it's, oh, it's very easy to accidentally share, information, share more information than I wanted to, accidentally get more things out there than I meant to. Now, you'll notice that this folder out here has a, a, a bolt on it. It's a locked, you know, just like with personal file sharing or Apple Share. If I protect something using access privileges, then I have to have a username and password. And this works the same way. We use the uh, access privileges model from personal file sharing. So I just set up users and groups within personal file sharing. And if I go ahead and in order to get access to the data in that file, I need to enter a username and password. And if I have the wrong username and password, it's going to come back and say, well, that isn't, that isn't correct. You have to try again. And now I can go ahead and, and now I have access to the files that are in, inside that folder. So not only is the data, it's very easily accessible, it's, I can also make it secure using the user groups, uh, using the personal file sharing users and groups. For more information on personal file sharing, you can either check out irvine.apple.com, and I have some demonstration, soft, demonstration files up there, demonstration scripts, and uh, you can also get access to the software up there. Um, if you have any other questions, then send me an email, stacey, S-T-A-C-E-Y, at apple.com. Hello, I'm Mike Vargas from Apple's Internet Product Marketing Group. Today I'll be demonstrating CyberDog 2.0, the latest version of Apple's integrated suite of Internet components that helps customers better manage their Internet access. It includes web browsing, email, access to FTP and Gopher sites, and a whole lot more. We begin from the CyberDog Tour. From here we can access all of CyberDog's components. We'll start with the email system. CyberDog has a very sophisticated email system. With CyberDog, I can handle multiple email accounts and sort the email into multiple trays. I can even create handlers that will sort the mail automatically. CyberDog also has a very fast and powerful full text search feature. I can do a full text search over all the text in my email very quickly and easily. And on the left side, it will return a relevance ranked return of the results. If we open a CyberDog email, you'll get a sense for how powerful the CyberDog email system is. It's a very rich email system, including stylized, colored and stylized text and graphics. And we can even include live links to FTP sites, to URLs, or Apple Talk networks. To show you some of the integration in CyberDog, I can just double click a, a live link from the email, and it automatically brings up the web browser. We've also improved CyberDog's web browser. We now support frames, animated GIFs, and HTTP cookies. In CyberDog's notebook, you can store URLs, email addresses, and any type of file. You can very easily drag and drop these files to your desktop. Again, it, with close integration with the Macintosh operating system. CyberDog Log keeps track of where you've been on the internet. It maintains a list of the last 100 sites that you visited, and you can then go back and examine this list either chronologically, alphabetically, or as a hierarchy of sites that you visited. CyberDog also includes a tool called Doc Builder that lets anyone very quickly and easily create their own internet access applications. 
What we see here is a blank CyberDog Doc Builder document. If I would like to create a button to access the internet, it's as simple as dragging open a button. I then drag and drop the URL or location on the internet that I would like to go to. And then I can also drag a picture to give it some context. I can also add in graphics. Create another notebook file to hold either locations on the internet or any kind of file. I'll show you some sample applications that were actually created by our customers. The first is an application created for UCLA students. There's a live browser window that shows the campus calendar, a notebook on the side to access resources for UCLA students, and buttons that will launch a web browser, for instance, to check the schedule of classes. Another example was created by the Small Business Administration. They wanted to collect internet resources for small business owners. Here you can see a button that goes out to the SBA home site. And you can even contact the SBA directly simply by selecting their email address. It brings up the CyberDog email system. And you can now email to the SBA. It's incredibly easy to create these very powerful applications with CyberDog's Doc Builder. Because CyberDog is based on Apple's OpenDoc technology, any other OpenDoc compatible application is now internet enabled through CyberDog. For example, Digital Harbor's Wave word processor includes CyberDog components. If I select the CyberDog tab from within Digital Harbor's Wave, I've got access to all the CyberDog components. I could browse the web or email directly from the word processor. CyberDog can be downloaded free from the CyberDog homepage at cyberdog.apple.com. Hi, my name is John Clem. I'm the product manager for Coco. Coco is a visual, interactive programming environment for kids with internet publishing capabilities. It's very simple to use, yet it's very powerful. Let's take a look at a demonstration of Coco. This is a Coco splash screen. It's very simple and it was designed for kids. You can either create a new world or open a saved world. Let's create a new world. In Coco, we have a simple toolbar with VCR controls that allow you to run the program and control the program. We have a stop and run, a forward and backwards, a program clock, and a speed control. We also have tools to create characters in the world. Let's create a character. We grab the paint tube and we start with a splatter of paint and we grab our paintbrush to open the character editing paint box. I won't embarrass myself by trying to create a character. I will paste one in from the scrapbook. Now we have a character in our world. Let's run the program and see what happens. Nothing happens because the character doesn't have any rules to behave by. Let's teach the character a rule. We grab the camcorder icon and click on the character and that opens the rule editor box. This is the state the character was in before it knew the rules. Now when I teach it a rule by showing it what to do, the character knows to always move forward to the next box. These are called graphical rewrite rules, and it's a patented technology that Apple has created. Let's see what happens when we run the program now. Now the fish knows to always swim forward. I'll close this world and open one that I've created previously. This is the same world, only it has a new character, seaweed, and the fish knows to flap its tail 
and to swim over the seaweed any time it encounters it. There can be any number of characters in your world and they can have any number of rules describing their behavior. In this case, the fish knows to flap its tail and to swim over the seaweed. Now let's publish this world to the internet. It's very simple. You just save the world for internet. You simply go to the finder window and grab the file and put it in your browser. It's as simple as that. We're now running our Cocoa World on the internet. Let's look at some previously created worlds. This is an example of a flower garden. It's a simulation of the ecosystem done by a sixth grade teacher for a class to explain how the ecosystem works. In this simulation, the bees pollinate the flowers and the seeds grow into flowers and the water evaporates and turn into cumulus clouds and they rain on the flowers and make them grow. And the user weeds the garden by clicking on the weeds. The interesting thing about this simulation is that the class, the sixth grade class, knew that this tool allowed you to customize the ecosystem and after they understood how it worked they asked the teacher to change the rain to acid rain. All the teacher had to do was click on the raindrop character, look at the list of rules, and change one of the rules to make the rain acid rain. This of course is a very effective teaching tool Let's go to another example. Here's a game that's created by a professional software publisher. This game illustrates that there will be worlds created by professional software publishers as well as curriculum publishers. The look is very different because professional artists have created the world. There are several developers that are currently making plans to develop content with Coco. As you have seen, Coco is simple enough to use for kids, yet powerful enough for developers. Coco is a design release and will be available as a product in July. For more information or to download Coco, go to www.coco.apple.com. The demos you just saw highlight just a few of the products that Apple is delivering to make building, serving, and surfing great websites, something that virtually anybody can do. Thanks very much.